Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast, starting with an eight millimeter. <clears throat> that was great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcasts. And we've got more questions, believe it or not, about an 8mm cartridge. I don't know what's going on with 8mm lately, but we just seem to be getting a lot of comments from folks on the 8mm. One of those was Alec, one of our uh, patrons. And he has uh, got something rolling with an 8mm Mauser. And that, of course, was the official German military round from about 1888 until well, after World War II. Um, and it was kind of the, I've always called it the grandfather of a lot of cartridges because it established the rimless design and the head diameter of 0.473 inches, which is the same for the 30 out 6 family of cartridges, all the 308 family of cartridges. 757 Mauser, 22250 Remington, just a lot of them based on that platform. So the 8 millimeter Mauser has been uh, an influencer for a long, long time. Let's just read what Alec had to say about him and how I responded to him because we always respond immediately to our patrons. Um, hi, Ron. I picked up an 8 millimeter Mauser and I have been trying to figure out more information on this round. The gun is a 1915 Gewehr 98. That would be the Mauser Model 98, the official bold action rifle of the German military. I didn't know how this compares to more conventional hunting and long range shooting rounds. I've tried looking around, but all I can find are answers that are saying one to two minutes of angle uh, accuracy with iron sights, but nothing about a scoped Mauser. Thanks for the information, Alec. Alec, this is a highly respected, well-made, fully modern rifle. The 8x57JS is quite similar in performance to our 30 out 6 except it shoots a 0.323-inch diameter bullet. It should throw 150 grain bullets around 2,950 or 9, 2,900 feet per second. 180 grain bullet, 2,700 feet per second. That's more than adequate for deer, elk, moose, bears, and the like. Accuracy will depend on barrel condition, the stock, and many other factors. The same is with any other rifle. I would give your barrel a thorough, deep cleaning, taking it down to bare metal if possible. This might require copper remover solvent after the carbon solvent has done its job. Then shoot two or three fouling rounds and then start shooting for groups trying various bullets and loads. Hand loading is best. Down the road, you might want to try epoxy bedding the receiver and recoil lug, perhaps floating the barrel or pressure bedding the tip of the barrel. There are lots of things to tweak if you want to. Good luck. And that's kind of basic information on any rifle, really, whether it's an old military rifle that's been sporterized or a modern rifle or something that you've inherited. If you want to check the accuracy, always start by cleaning that barrel because some guys will shoot and shoot and shoot and never really clean a barrel or at least not clean it well. So to give it a fair start, clean down to bare metal. And then, as I say, a couple of fouling rounds are usually required for consistency. Then you can begin your load development. And if you're not a hand loader, you can try different brands and different bullet weights and sizes. It all has to do with harmonics of the barrel. When a bullet goes down a barrel with all of that pressure, and the drag of the bullet in the rifling and all, it creates vibrations in that barrel. And those vibrations can make that barrel oscillate, wiggle up and down. We don't see it, but it's happening. And if it's inconsistent because the load is inconsistent in its pressures, you would get inaccuracy. Um, or if there's some imperfection in the rifling, especially at the crown, right where the bullet exit, you can also jet the gases inconsistently on one side of the bullet or the other and change the accuracy, things like that. But if the stock is touching the barrel and giving it pressure variably, left or right, up and down, whatever, 
that can change it. There are just all sorts of things that can change your accuracy. But sometimes just merely changing the pressure, the load, the bullet weight, or something that changes those oscillations will make the difference. So that's why I say try different bullets, different loads. Of course, hand loaders have an easier job of that because they can just load up three cartridges and figure out roughly how accurate or inaccurate it's going to be. They don't have to buy a whole box of ammunition. Now, if you have buddies with the same rifle, the same chambering, you could swap out, hey, you try this load and I'll try your load and my rifle and figure out which one works best that way. But that's always a great place to start before you need to dive into more detailed work with, uh, repairing things like the stock and the action and blueprinting and maybe even buying a new barrel someday. But boy, that's the extreme. Before you go there, there are a lot of little tricks that you can try. All right. Thanks for that one, Alec. And thanks for being a supporting member of Ron Spomer Outdoors Patreon community. We really appreciate the help you folks give us. If anyone else out there is interested in joining us at Ron Spomer Outdoors on Patreon, just go to patreon.com and then Ron Spomer Outdoors and all the instructions there for joining us. And you get a few perks and bennies, but uh, generally the basic idea is that you enjoy these broadcasts and our YouTube channel on Ron Spomer Outdoors and the website and the blogs and all the rest of it and just are welcome to help us out. We really appreciate it. All right, now here are the questions that the team has pulled up. And this is from British Columbia. Martin in British Columbia asks, Hi, Ron, I haven't seen any mention of the 338 RCM. That's the Ruger Compact Magnum. I purchased an all-weather Ruger Hawkeye 338 RCM with a 22-inch SS barrel, stainless synthetic setup, sounds like. I believe this is really one of the best all-round cartridges ever made. The case is identical to the 6.5 PRC, but in 338 caliber. It has superior cycling in a bolt gun compared to the WSM. That would be the 325 Winchester short magnum that he's uh, mentioning there, I think. It shoots bullets from 160 grains to 250 grains, and it is excellent for any game from deer to bison. The 338 RCM has slightly more case capacity than the 30 6 and a manageable recoil. It's efficient in a compact or standard rifle. Ron, could you please spend some time on one of your podcasts explaining the value of this seemingly forgotten cartridge? Keep up the good work and thanks for sharing your knowledge. All right. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, that's a good point. You do not hear much about the 338 RCM. It is another one of these short fat magnums in a caliber that's not all that popular with hunters. And once you get over 30, you're starting to slow down interest. But you are correct in that it is wonderfully efficient. Anytime you have a given powder supply in a cartridge and you Enlarge the neck diameter, shoot a larger diameter bullet. You increase the efficiency because there's more surface area for the pressures to work against to move that bullet. What you give up, though, is ballistics coefficient in that bullet uh, if it's the same weight. In other words, if you're shooting a 180 grain bullet in the 30 caliber and a 180 grain bullet in a 33 caliber, you're going to get more ballistics efficiency out of the narrower bullet if they're both given the same spire point shape and a boat tail, et cetera, et cetera. But for closer ranges, you've got more energy in the bigger bullet. So you're generally going to load up a heavier, longer bullet in the larger calibers. And that's is what he's doing with the 338 when he goes up to the 250 grain bullet. Pretty hard to push one of those in most 30s. Some of them will certainly do it, but it's not a standard thing. At any rate, the value in that is, yeah, that makes for a pretty effective hard-hitting elk round, moose round. And it is quite comparable to the 325 uh, Winchester. That one uses a 0.323 inch diameter bullet. So the 338 Ruger is a little bit wider bullet. So you would think, all right, 338, we're looking at the 338 Win Mag. This is a short fat magnum. The case diameter on the uh, Ruger Compact Magnums is not quite as big around as the WSMs. So they are mm, roughly comparable in, in powder capacity, however. 30 degree shoulder on the 338 RCM, 35 degree shoulder on the 325. So that gives it an additionally a little more powder space. 
Um, some people will say that the getting up to the 35 degree shoulder gets a little bit too sharp and it's interfering with feeding out of the magazine sometimes. I haven't found it to be an issue, but some people say it is in some rifles. Why isn't the 338 uh, Ruger Compact Magnum as popular? Well, well, really, the 325 WSM isn't all that popular either. Neither one of them really caught on. The 325 had a head start by the time the 338 Ruger came along. People had already played around with it a little bit. And I think folks who were interested in this whole idea of having a short action 338 or roughly 325, 323 diameter bullet uh, had already done it. So Ruger comes in a little bit late to the party. Now, the 338 Ruger Compact Magnum was based on a 375 Ruger Compact Magnum, which is a little more successful because it matches and or exceeds the performance of the 375 H&H, &H, which, is, of course, is your full-length, long Magnum case, a bit narrower than the Ruger. Um, that one is doing pretty well, and I think that one's going to hang around. But the 338, I don't know. Uh, the 6.5, as you mentioned, uh, PRC version of it, neck down to 6.5. That one, I think, is going to be a standard. That's going to last, I think, and take off pretty effective, but just, just not a big demand for the 338. That said, you're absolutely right. It is an outstanding performer for elk and, of course, deer, um, but moose and bears, too. So, I mean, if you have one, celebrate it. If you don't, you're interested in it. You might find a used gun at a fairly good price in the 338 Ruger Compact Magnum just because so few people know about it. And I think when you're in a used gun store and you see something like that, you just go, what's this? And they don't pay that much attention to it. So you might want to bone up on it, uh, do some research, look into hand-loading manuals and figure out what sort of velocity you can expect. But according to Martin here, <laughs> he loves it. It performs very well for his style of hunting. So something you might want to look into. All right. This is Andrew from Ohio. Hi, Ron. I very much enjoy the material you produce, especially when you draw from personal experience. The only problem I have with it <laughs> is that when you talk about a cartridge about which I know nothing, I get a hankering for a new firearm. <laughs> yeah, some people accuse me of being as a uh, uh, salesman for the uh, ammo and gun companies. I'm out here to sell more product. Well, I probably would if I got a cut, but I don't. <laughs> no, I'm uh, I'm just interested in sharing what I know and helping all of us enjoy this whole unusual avocation of guns and ammo and ballistics and hunting and all the things we love to do. <laughs> Let's get back to Andrew's letter here. For example, after watching your video on the 35 Remington, I now have a strong desire to get a Remington Model 8 rifle. <laughs> that one might be a bit hard to find. They haven't made that for a long time. That's an early autoloader from about 1906. I guess there's worse problems to have. My question, my question is about camouflage clothing for hunting. Oh, we got a whole nother direction here. Do you think it grants any benefit over plain, solid, seasonal earth tones? I can't help but think there's a lot of benefit, but I don't have the field experience that you and others do. Thank you and keep up the good work. Okay, now I'm going to going to step in it here and hurt my potential for getting paid from any of these manufacturers because I'm going to say that in my experience, camouflage clothing is largely a gimmick. Ooh, they're going to hate me for this. Now, don't get me wrong, I have a lot of camouflage clothing, and camouflage can work, especially for humans and monkeys and other animals that really see color in detail, and this would include most birds. Birds are extremely acute in their color perception. They can see further into the spectrum than we can, but most mammals cannot. They go kind of from the yellowish end of the spectrum to the blues. They're pretty strong in the blues. Any animal that sees really well at night has more rod cone cells in his eye than um, rod cells than cone cells. The cone cells detect color. The rod cells enhance light absorption so you can see better in dim light situations. And that's the sacrifice they make. They get uh, more rods, deer and all the nocturnal animals, so they can see well at night. They need to see motion and, and react to it rather than detail and color. But humans, obviously, we've got pretty good spectrum of color vision. And then camouflage helps a lot 
A, the earth tones, most importantly, you want to blend the tones and you don't want to have something with a high contrast. You know, orange, the, uh, hunter orange obviously stands out because you don't see that in nature a lot until the fall colors. <laughs> uh, hot pink, um, the really chartreuse greens stand out. So if you dress in a green or a brown or a tan that matches the general tone of the woods or the forest floor or the grasslands, you are in the next thing is to break up the shape and obviously the shape of the human animal stands out because we're one of the few erect ones walking on two legs if you can break that up that's a good form of camouflage i think what happens with the camouflage companies is they're mostly coming from the perspective of close range bow hunters where the leafy patterns and all the little tight sticks and rocks and things they put in those patterns would blend in at close range and you see pictures of it, especially in their ads, when they find just the perfect setting in which that particular camouflage pattern seems to disappear quite effectively. But what I found with these game animals that don't see color all that well, once they've got your basic form outline and or you move, the jig is up. That is what they're catching is motion. I have hunted enough wearing blaze orange, mandatory hat, vest usually, and gotten within easily bow distance, slingshot distance, sometimes even touching distance of game, simply by not letting them see me move. They look right at me. I'm wearing blaze orange and obviously standing out in the environment, and they don't, they don't notice it until I move. So sitting against a tree, I have had elk come right up to my boot and almost touch it as they smelled it and then ran off. I've had deer walk right up to me. I've called coyotes within easy shooting distance while I'm sitting on an open grassy hillside wearing blaze orange. I haven't noticed a huge improvement when I'm wearing camouflage. However, it can't hurt. Bow hunters absolutely love it. Turkey hunters insist on it. And I wear it when I'm turkey hunting because that's a sharp-eyed bird that sees color very well. But again, it's mostly the motion. So if you have a matching earth tone sort of thing, like a deer does, or a cougar, or most wildlife, they're not dressed up in lots of breaking up lines and things, uh, you're going to do just fine. You'll notice that a deer stops in the woods with just a few, a few vertical trunks between you and it. And on a gray day, you have difficulty seeing where the trees leave off and the deer starts and vice versa. <laughs> it, no complicated patterns in there at all for camouflage it's just the tone and not moving so there's a lot more with camouflage and if you want to really be a nitpicker you can get into the details of it obviously the military develops it and uses it to effect but again that's because of the human animal seeing it not so much the hunted species that we're looking for so i don't think you can go wrong by wearing camouflage it's sort of become the new Elmer Fudd outfit, you know, instead of the red and black plaid checked stuff we had back in the 40s and 50s, we now all wear camouflage. It shows that you've got on the uniform and you're a member of the club. <laughs> but if you're like me and you kind of like to stand out from the club and not have people push you into doing a certain thing a certain way, I'd rather do it my way. <laughs> you can go ahead and wear your earth tones and I don't think it's going to hamper your success in the field. Just don't let them see you move. All right. That was a good one. I hope I didn't get into too much hot water with that one. All right. Oh, who do we have now from Iowa? I think someone named Matt wants a question answered. Either that or he's going to chew me out. <laughs> Hello, Ron. It's been a long time. I have been a long time listener and viewer. So anyway, here's my question. Have you ever heard of the 25 Creedmoor? It's been pretty popular in PRS long range shooting matches. From everything I've seen and have heard, it matches up pretty well to a 257 Roberts plus P, but with longer high BC bullets. I own several 257 Roberts. I'm currently building a 257 Robert AI with a 1 and 7 twist barrel on a long action, or I might make a 25 Creedmoor on a short action. What do you think would be the better option? Also, do you think the 25 Creedmoor is something manufacturers would bring out to market today or soon? Something worth looking at as a modern day replacement for the 257 Roberts. All right, lots of stuff on the uh, 25 Creedmoor. What's gone on here is that 
shortly after the Creedmoor came out, of course, the Wildcatters start playing with it, as they always do, necking it up and down. And they necked it down to 25. The reason it never really took off, that was around 2018, probably when they started that, is because there are not as many available bullets that have high BCs. Long high BC bullets in the 25s just have not been out there. And it was Blackjack Ace that made a 131 grain 257 bullet. Long, sleek, high BC. And they were, of course, set up for the Wildcatters. Guys would make fast twist barrels for their 257 Roberts, 25 out sixes, 257 Weatherby mags. And then they started playing around with this Creedmoor because, of course, they like all the other attributes of that case set up for precision shooting. Uh, it's consistency, it's straight walls, it's 30 degree shoulder, it's long neck, and it's just optimized for performance in a short action rifle. The 257 Roberts is a short action, but with the old fashioned relatively short bullets. So in order to get that to be effective in a short action, you increase the magazine length so you can use longer bullets and then get a custom chamber with a longer throat and lead, et cetera, et cetera. It's probably just easier to go with the 25 Creedmoor. And because it has been so successful in your long-range PRS-style matches and whatnot, I think it is going to reach a point at which some manufacturer is going to say, I think I'm going to grab this one, as they often do with Wildcats, and legitimize it. And I would guess Hornady would seem to be the first choice there. They'd say, well, you know what? We've got the 6.5 uh, Creedmoor. We've got the 6mm Creedmoor. Why not the 25 Creedmoor? So they would come out with it that way. And it also wouldn't surprise me if they took the 6.5 PRC and necked that down to 25, or at least the Wildcat, or I'm sure some have done it. So, yeah, I, I think it is probably going to become legit. Now, there are more bullets than that Blackjack that are long and sleek. Um, Hornady has come out with one. I think it's around 130, 133 grains. Berger has a 135 grain. So they've got some really long, high, highly efficient high BC bullets in 25 now, and they're getting up into the sixes. And you'll end up with probably better performance out of the 25 Creedmoor than the 6 millimeter Creedmoor and certainly than the 6.5 Creedmoor. So worth looking into? I think so. Um, I'm also looking forward to some faster twist barrels in the good old 25-06, still one of my favorites. And of course, the ultimate would be the 257 Weatherby Magnum with a long, heavy bullet like that. Oh, and don't forget to look at some of the copper bullets, some of the longer copper bullets. They're obviously going to be a lot lighter in weight because of the less dense material, but you can get some outstanding hunting performance from those copper bullets. I've been using a 92 grain bullet in my 25-06 with a traditional 1 in 10 twist rate. It'll stabilize that. That's a hammer hunter bullet, and boy, <laughs> you can really drive those things fast for some incredible performance. So yeah, stay tuned. Keep watching those 25s. I don't know what to tell you to get, Matt. Um, I think you're on it here. If you really want a true short action, I think the easy route to go is the 25 Creedmoor. You just buy six millimeter Creedmoors and neck them up to 25. You go from a 24 to 25, not that big a deal. You should be able to easily neck those up just running them through your expanding ball and your sizing die. You should be in business. But yes, I do look forward to this becoming a commercial cartridge. All right, Micah from Arizona. Dear Ron, thanks so much for the great podcast. Two exclamation points. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike. I appreciate that. I have successfully harvested my first elk on a junior hunt in Arizona using a Marlin 336 3030 lever action. Well, congratulations, Mike. Micah, that had to be exciting. I can remember my first deer. I think I was 16 years old when I finally got to go deer hunting in South Dakota, and I was using a 3030 lever action, but mine was the Model 94 Winchester. But whoa, what an exciting time that was. Uh, let's get to the question here. Micah asks then, I would like to have a little more power and stay with a lever action. Do you have any suggestions? Ah, okay. Now, this I did too. After a few seasons with the 3030, I wanted a little more reach, so I started snooping around. That's how I got into bold action rifles. But if you want to stick with lever actions, you've got some great options. Two of them that pop into my mind are the Browning BLR rifle and the Henry Sidegate um, Long Ranger. Both of these are functioning with a rack and pinion system instead of a direct connection from the lever 
to the bolt moving it back and forth. There's a sort of a ladder stair step underneath the body of the bolt and then sort of a wheel uh, ratcheted thing. I'll think of a gear on the lever. So the gear is activating the matching gear grooves in the bolt to drive it back and forth. And then there's a rotating locking lug up front. And then here's the important part. The magazine is a vertical stack similar to what you see in bold action rifles, not the tubular magazine you have on your 3030 model 336 Marlin. The tubular magazine is what holds back the 3030 and similar cartridges because they traditionally do not load sharply pointed bullets. The theory being that one bullet riding with its point against the base of the other bullet in the tubular magazine could function under recoil as a firing pin against that primer. If you have five to seven in that tubular magazine and you get a heavy recoil and they jerk together and one sets the next one off, you can imagine what's going to happen. Now, there are arguments that this never happens and there are even tests that have been done trying to make it happen and the jury is still out on it, but pretty much indicates it doesn't happen, but the manufacturers stick with round nose or flat nosed bullets in the 3030, the 32 special, the 4570, all those old cartridges for tubular magazines. Better to be safe than sorry. So the easiest way to do this is to go with one of the vertical stack magazine rifles, the Browning BLR, the Henry um, Long Ranger, and both can be remarkably accurate. I don't know if the BLR comes in standard length cartridges. That would be the 30 out 6 family, 270, 30 out 6, et cetera, et cetera. But they will certainly have the 308 Winchester, which might be a wonderful upgrade from your 3030. You'll end up with the sharply pointed bullets. You'll be able to drive them much faster because it takes higher pressures. The 308 is just revered as a great all around, you name it, it'll take it cartridge. I think that's probably where you'll want to go. Ammunition is abundant in a lot of varieties. Um, if you want to be a nitpicker ballistics nut like me, you would go for a 7 millimeter 08 version, but they probably don't make that. If you want less recoil, 243 is a pretty good option. And who knows these days, I haven't looked lately, but they may be chambering the 6.5 Creedmoor in some of those. So just dive into those two options. There may be some other lever actions out there I'm blanking on right now that are similar. But the thing you want to look for is a lever action that uses that vertical stack magazine. And that will get you to a more effective cartridge. Now we're going to Australia. Frank. Frank says this would be an interesting comparison. I know the 3030 comparisons have been done many times, but how about a 3030 versus a six millimeter 223? Whoa. I've recently come across a six millimeter 223, and I thought, what a brilliant little cartridge for hand loaders. Use 223 Remington brass and 243 projectiles. What? Very similar energy, but different velocities and diameter and better long range. You know, it kind of went two ways here. Six millimeter, two. Okay, I got you. Yeah. All right. This is what I first thought you were talking about. You're taking the 223 Remington brass, you neck it up and load 243 bullets on it. And this has been around for quite a while as a wildcat. And it's fairly popular. Obviously, you don't get the high velocity you would with a 22 caliber, but you get a bigger, heavier bullet. Um, yeah, that would be an interesting comparison. I know right offhand the 243 Winchester can outshoot the 3030 as far as delivering energy downrange, just because of the sharper bullets, the narrower bullets, you have a much higher BC in your 243, and it starts at a much higher velocity. So it's a better downrange energy delivering projectile. Although a lot of people will argue that because it is a lightweight one, the 3030 hits harder. You're going to have to ask the deer about it. I have had excellent success taking deer with both the 3030 and the 243 6 millimeter family. But I have not gone to the lesser powder charge you're going to have with that little 223 brass. If you're looking for efficiency and light recoil at relatively shorter ranges, which of course you're suggesting with the 3030 here, you're talking about performance out to about 150, maybe 200 yards. And I think you're probably going to be delivering more energy and a flatter trajectory with your six millimeter 223 hybrid wildcat cartridge. 
but I haven't looked at the data. I might do that someday. Generally, I don't cover a lot of the wildcats specifically because so few have them. Most folks know about the commercial cartridges and have access to them. You start talking about a specific wildcat and good Lord, there are hundreds of them. So I don't generally say, hey, let's feature the whatever wildcat today unless it's an extremely popular one and or one that's become a commercial cartridge like the 25-06 or the 22250. But still a good idea, Frank, and thanks for bringing it up. I think most people probably don't know about the 6-millimeter version of the 223. All right, now we're going to bounce from Australia way over to Europe, Germany, and this is Max from Germany. Hey, a fan from Germany, I love your podcasts. In the last episode, someone asked why there aren't any pump action rifles. Well, Krieg Hoff, Krieg Hoff, just released the Krieg Hoff Semprio, which is a pump action rifle specifically designed for driven hunts in Europe. I think the largest caliber for it is 9.3 by 62. That's a good one. That nine, I did a video on the 9.3 three by 62 in the model 704 action bold action uh, to demonstrate it and i was impressed with that cartridge it's an oldie but goodie uh, often compared to the 375 h and h it uses a 0.366 inch diameter bullet and it drives it to around 2500 feet per second as i recall and it's quite popular in africa especially in the old german colonies like tanzania um, and it has proven so effective on elephant that it's been grandfathered in in several countries to be useful uh, and legal for elephant and buffalo just because there were so many rifles for it and has worked for so many years. So, um, yeah, a Semprio. Now, I've worked with the Semprio autoloading rifle. So this one would be real similar using a locking rotating bolt up front, but they just made it a pump instead of the autoloader. So that could be fun. Anyone interested in the good old Pump action center fire cartridges and rifles. Check out this new Kragoff Semprio, S E M P R I O. I will do that myself after reading this, Max. So thanks for that information and guten tag. This is uh, someone from Texas, and there are a lot of Germans who settled in Texas way back when in the uh, hill country. So Vernon from Texas may be related to Max from Germany. Hi, Mr. Spomer. I have recently discovered your channel and have been very much enjoying it and learning a lot. Well, thank you. Appreciate that, Vernon. My questions are purely speculative and out of curiosity. With much your talk recently on the longer bullets combined with higher twist rates or lower twist rate ratios, what is the lowest twist ratio ever commercially produced and in what caliber? Have any wildcatters gone off the rails, per se, and experimented with crazy ideas like a one-to-one -one twist or a one-to-four twist? What would theoretically or speculatively happen to a gun like that? Would you theoretically happen? What would theoretically happen to the bullet? Ah, so many questions. I totally understand if you put other fans' questions first. No worries. But ever since I started watching your videos and gaining a smidgen of knowledge from your vast knowledge, I have been wondering about those things. So thanks for all the great content. Sincerely, Vernon. Okay, Vernon, you're thinking, man, I like this. And those are some darn good questions. Okay, twist rates. I think all of us understand this, but let me just get real basic here. You put a twist in a rifle to make it a rifle. That's what rifling means. You're putting twist in the barrel to spin the projectile. Before they spun projectiles, you didn't have much for accuracy. Well, they were shooting round balls, and round balls are fairly accurate because they're round. <laughs> it's the same all over. But if you can spin them, they are a little more accurate. And once you went with a long bullet, an elongated bullet, in the early days, they called them mini balls. Okay, they weren't balls anymore. Still rounded in the front end, but then they had this long shank. And the longer the shank went, you know, the more stabilizing you needed to do. So it's like throwing a football. You've got to spin it so it doesn't have a wobbly flight. So the original muzzle loaders, balls, you didn't need much of a spin at all on those first early rifled um, flintlocks throwing a ball, I think it's like one in 48 or maybe even more than that. That means 48, four feet of barrel before you made one twist of rifling, <laughs> not much. But then as they went with the longer and longer mini balls, modern bullets, so to speak, 
you had to increase that spin rate to a one in 30 something, one in 28. It just depended on how long the bullet was. Well, we misconstrued that to mean weight because obviously the longer bullets weigh more. So we always just sort of said, if you shoot heavy bullets, you got to have more twist. Well, it was the length, not the mass. But at any rate, they had to figure out and there's, there's a guy named Greenhill. He was in the military. He came up with a formula to determine what your basic twist rate needs to be for a certain length of bullet. The Greenhill formula. I don't even know it. Can't do the math on it myself, but it's out there. These days, pretty much everything's done for you by the factories or right on the box or something. But that's the basic idea. Now, how fast can you go with your twist rates? Well, there's no reason to go with a faster twist rate unless you need it. Once you stabilize your bullet, why fool around? You don't gain anything with more twist. You can introduce more problems. And think of it this way. The rifling represents kind of a wall. The bullet diameter is larger than the bore diameter because the bullet has to fit down to the bottom of the grooves in that rifling. So you make a, say, a 30 caliber bore has a 0 0.30 inch diameter hole in it. Now you have to rifle it by cutting depth in that spiral. And the depth is 308. That's why you shoot 0 0.308 inch diameter bullets through a 0 0.300 diameter bore. That then lets the bullet get grabbed by that steel. You shave a little bit of bullet off as you do that, but it's necessary in order to grab it. And then the bullet is wide enough to fill the bottoms of the grooves to seal the gases so you can get full pressure pushing the bullet out. That's how all that stuff works. So if you increase the rate at which those rifling is spinning, you go from a 1 to 16 to a 1 to 12 to a 1 to 10 to a 1 to 9 to a 1 to 6. You're, you're making a wall in those grooves that that bullet hits, and it increases the tension, the pressure, because the bullet has got to spin to get around that wall. And if it's a, an abrupt wall, almost at a right angle with a one-to-one, -one, um, you're going to get a lot more pressure. And you've got to figure that into your hand loads, your factory loads, or anything, because there's a maximum pressure you can put in that barrel before you blow it up. So you've got to weigh all those factors. And if you increase the spin too much and you have a fairly frangible bullet, like a lot of the simple cup and core bullets are, it's just soft lead inside of a thin gilding metal jacket, you can tear the jacket with the friction of that rifling, and then you, you don't have a bullet anymore. You got to spray when it comes out the muzzle. So, um, that's one of the problems you face. However, if you want to shoot a really, really long bullet and you want to shoot it fairly slowly, you have to increase the twist rate because the velocity of the bullet plays a role in it as well as the spin rate. With factory rifles and their standard uh, twist rates, like a 30 out 6 one in 10 twist, they figured that is going to stabilize a 220 grain bullet all the way down to 100, 100, 110 grain bullet. That's a lot of variety in bullets, and it'll handle all of them pretty darn well. And they knew that's basically what people would be shooting, but mostly it'd be 150 to 180 grain bullets. Perfect for that. So that kind of compromise it and put it right in the middle. Now, if you want to go really crazy and say, I want to shoot a 250 grain bullet in my 308, you're going to have to increase your twist rate. Then it's not going to be as versatile with the shorter bullets. Well, these days we're making some crazy things like uh, the one I can think of offhand is the um, 8.6. Um, what's the name of that thing? Blackout? Yeah. The 8.6 Blackout. This one was new to me just a few months ago when someone brought it up, but it's another one of these short subsonic things that they're making. Now you can throw a big heavy bullet, not very fast, but it's very quiet and doesn't have much recoil. But what they've done with the long bullets to stabilize them, they probably needed to go to a one in six twist pretty fast. They went to one in three. I don't know if that was absolutely necessary to stabilize these big bullets. Now this is a 338. Uh, bullet, I believe. Maybe it's a 323. Don't quote me on this one. I'm not sure which one it uses, but I'm pretty confident that the 8.6 blackout is using a, a 338-inch diameter bullet and probably a 225, 250 grain. And 
I forgot what the case is made out of, but it's really tiny. There's not much powder in there driving that thing. But as long as it's stabilized, you got a lot of mass and a lot of momentum to get down range. So it seems to be working. And these quiet guns for taking out mainly hogs, I think. Feral pigs is why they got this thing developed. So they thought we can enhance the impact of that bullet by having it spin really fast. One in three twist ends up giving that thing about 500,000 revolutions per minute. So you've got this centrifugal force in that bullet. In addition to the forward force, the spinning force contributes to it as that bullet breaks up or expands. Hits, expands, and it's rotating that quickly. You're doing more damage that way. And they've pretty much proven that with the tests they've done on it. So that's the fastest twist I can think of. Um, yeah, sounds like they've gone off the rails with a one and three, but it works. That's the point. And there's a reason that they went with it. So I hope this provided a little bit more information for you, Vernon. I'm sorry I didn't have the exact numbers on that 8.6 cartridge. As they say, it's new to me. I have never used one. And with all the data I try cramming in this old hard drive, sometimes things get mixed up a bit. If anyone out there has better information on this 8.6, and I'm pretty sure it's called the blackout, but I might even have that one wrong. <laughs> but just write in and let us know, and I will be happy to correct it in our next episode. All right, that looks like it's the end of our questions, guys. You kind of surprised me here. Get going, and I think it's going to last forever, and suddenly we're done. So I want to thank uh, Vernon and Max and Frank and Micah and all the rest of you guys for sending in your comments and questions. And thanks to our patrons. Um, send us anything and everything you've got. The more we hear from you and the more inspired we get, the more topics you suggest we cover, by, by golly, the more we do cover. And that's, I think, what we're all here for. So let me know if you're enjoying these podcasts. Let me know if you want some more interviews. I know several guys recently have asked me to get a hold of Gun Blue. He's a pretty successful older gentleman who's got a, a channel with a lot of great information. This guy has been a gunsmith for ages and ages, and he really knows his stuff. We're going to try to get a hold of him if we can find him. Um, and if you have any other ideas, let us know. In the meantime, have a good week. Hunt honest and shoot straight. <laughs>